my second year at this conference, and last year we also had tech difficulties. So I think I'm first. <laughs> I will not be coming next year. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's okay. You know what? It's all right. We'll just okay. Go ahead. So I'm an anthropologist by training, but at Wheaton I'm in the art art history department, and half of my faculty role is to be curator of Wheaton's permanent collection. The uh, permanent collection was not compiled until 1974, and I'm going to skip around because we're, I want to make sure we have time for questions. The collection wasn't compiled until 1974, but the very first objects came on campus in 1834 when the seminary was founded because, of course, the founding family wanted to be recognized as the founders of the institution. So they gave portraits and they also gave landscapes to decorate what was then a very, very small campus. Over time, there were alumni and their families and friends of Wheaton and even strangers who donated objects to the institution. And um, this is Mrs. Wheaton as a young woman. It's not going to work. Sorry, there we go. Mrs. Wheaton as a young woman, one of the landscape that's really advanced. And as you can see, it is a very, very eclectic co collection. It was compiled in uh, 1974. But we know that by 1907, the trustees were actually starting to purchase artwork to be used for teaching. Uh, because they saw the pedagogical value of all these objects that had ended up on campus. So it is at its heart a teaching collection. We do not have a museum. If we count everything, it's over 10,000 objects, but right now we're going with 6,000 because that seems like it's a much more uh, reasonable number to deal with. And it's everything from, yeah, it's just me, folks. So it's, it's a lot to do, and I have a great team of work study students who help me. So it's everything from Greco-Roman and Egyptian antiquities to 21st century contemporary art. You name it, we probably have an example of it. Textiles, ceramics, glass, uh, busts. This is actually the boy and the bird in the Boston Public Gardens. This is one of the preliminary models. It was found in the basement of one of the dining halls. <laughs> so the impetus for the project that I'm going to talk about today uh, came from the Frick Collection, which is a, a museum-like institution based in New York City. And uh, about now, three years ago, one of their postdoctoral researchers contacted me and said, do you have this painting in your collection? Because we have this photograph, and we think that this is a painting, and do you still have it? This painting was done by an American-born artist named Gary Melchers, who was uh, born in Detroit, but lived most of his life and trained in Europe. And he founded an artist colony in Holland, which is where Audrey was actually painted. And um, the Frick Collection inquiry was really interesting for me because it provided more information about the history of the painting, provided this incredible photograph that we now have printed out and in the object file. But what it also did is it really engaged my students. So my advisees and my work study students thought that this was the coolest detective story ever. And how could, you know, this was great, could they do this kind of work in, in working for me? And I thought more about it and I thought, okay, well, this would be a really good class assignment to engage my students and to get them interested in working with objects because object-based learning is integral to what I do and it's also something that I try to get other faculty to do on campus. So I decided to develop an assignment that would get students to do what is called provenance research. For those of you not art historians or anthropologists or museum people, um, at its very heart provenance is about the ownership history of an object. And many of us are more familiar with it now because of movies like George Clooney's Monuments Men or The Rape of Europa, which is a documentary, or most recently, Woman in Gold, which is about the history of this absolutely spectacular painting. It's uh, Gustav Klimt's portrait of Adele Blockbauer, which was eventually restituted to the uh, heirs of the original owner because it was looted by the Nazis. Um, it is now in the Neue Gallery in New York City because, of course, if you get a painting that is worth $100 million, you can't really keep it in your house. So they sold it at auction and it was bought by the Lauer family and put on display. Uh, these are just different definitions to give you a sense of what it means, um, what provenance means. And over the past 50 years, it's become increasingly important for museums and like institutions to understand the provenance of their object because there are national laws, international conventions, and a very active black market trade in objects that mean that you can get into some really significant legal or PR trouble if you don't actually know what you have. Provenance mapping um, appealed to me, the idea of provenance mapping, or what I'm calling provenance mapping, appealed to me because provenance is about the movement of objects over space and time and about the movement of objects between people and institutions. So you can, you can really help students to understand the concept and some of the um, gaps in the narrative that appear 
if you incorporate maps. And this is just an example of kind of how Audrey moved. So Gary Melcher is painted within the Palmer uh, collection in Chicago. This amazing mansion is no longer extant. Was acquired by Mrs. Watson of the IBM Watsons and then donated to Wheaton in the 1950s. So in conjunction with LIS staff, so people like Jenny and others, and supported by a blended learning grant from our provost office in fall of 2013, I developed the initial iteration of the assignment and I found that the basic elements of the assignment, the idea of having students do provenance research, which is by its very nature, very complex, convoluted, and in failure is inherent to the process, you will fail. Um, I decided to um, have students do this kind of research and to do it first in a first year seminar that was focused on cultural property. It was called Gift or Loot, Who Controls Cultural Property. Uh, we began by using Google Earth, we then switched to Omeka, and now we're using StoryMap.js. I then have used the assignment three times further in uh, Introduction to Museum Studies, and it is a semester-long project. Through this process, the students, we've created five Google Earth maps, there are 21 mini exhibitions on Omeka, 13 story maps, and we had course evaluations that discussed the students were not asked about the project in the course evaluations, but they talked about it in the course evaluations, we also did pre-semester and post-semester surveys. And some of those I did not have access to, of course, until my grades were submitted so they could say as many mean things as they wanted about the project. And in the end, we now have 39 objects in the collection that have been more fully documented. I had a wide variety of learning outcomes and goals. As an instructor, I had certain goals, but as a curator of a collection for which I am the only staff member, and it's a pretty big collection for an institution of our size, any, anyone else who can do my work for me, that's great. So I wanted students to improve, um, I wanted to improve cloud production documentation and to create a means of promoting student work in the collection beyond campus. Um, I have used what the students have created as teaching tools in other courses. And of course, there's all these aspects of the learning for the students. Um, one thing that was very important was for me to understand that you can actually learn something from looking at an object or working with an object. So just as a case in point, this vase would be a really good um, object to use if you wanted to tell the story of the trade between China and New England in the 19th century, or if you wanted to talk about mid 20th century dating norms on a single sex campus. Mm -hmm. This vase was kidnapped by men from Harvard repeatedly and held hostage until they would hold a dance so that the men could come to campus and court the beaten women. So there's all sorts of different types of stories that can be told. Uh, the assignment guidelines or components of uh, student choice is inherent to my pedagogy. I think it stretches back to when I was an undergraduate and I had a faculty member who said you can write any research paper topic you want, which I thought was fantastic. And of course students have often said they really like that about my classes. So the students were allowed to choose an object from a Google Doc list and it was a list of um, you name it type of object we had it. So Native North American baskets. Uh, Egyptian Coptic textiles, this lovely base that we now know was probably looted uh, mm -hmm. because of student research, and um, it gave them an opportunity to choose something about which they were interested, so they would be invested in the project. The components of the project, uh, some of them were graded, some of them were not, and they were due over the course of the semester so that they didn't leave all the work until the very end, because again, I didn't want any of them to fail the class or the assignment. I was happy if they failed to find out the provenance narrative but I also wanted to make sure that there, there was a way for me to see the progress as they were going on. They also had access to a wide variety of resources. If any of you have collections on your campus, I know Bryn Mawr does, but anyone here from the five colleges, you have amazing collections. Um, you can do this type of work. You can, you can work with any staff you have ties to the collection and do this type of work. This was probably, in many ways, the most helpful genealogical websites, which you can access for free. Um, I did eventually buy subscriptions to make it easier. Students were able to reach out to faculty and staff, donors, gallery, auction house staff. I mean, we were emailing with people in China and Japan. It was really fantastic. I did, however, control this access. It had to be facilitated to me because, of course, I didn't want them emailing an esteemed professor in Tokyo and saying, hey, professor, I was just wondering. And so it was very formal language and talking about professionalization and how they can carry that forward into their post. <laughs> Career. Uh, this is Marjorie Gell Jones, who's one of our major uh, alumni donors to this collection. 
The first time it was um, used again was in fall of 2013 with the first year seminar. It is a first year seminar, so the students were not necessarily interested in uh, museum studies or art history. They were uh, ended up doing over 12 different majors. The 15 students are in 12 different majors. And we, I decided to have them do a team-based project because first year seminar, we want students to do team-based projects. And of course they hated that, hated it, hated it, hated it. But they really loved the idea of the project. And in the class evaluation, just the standard class evaluation, 42% of it, them said that this project was one of the strongest elements of the course. So completely unprompted, they really, really liked it. They um, ended up working on five different objects and they, we used Google Earth and um, you saw Domingo how the globe was spinning, so you can imagine that happening with this object going over space and time. They, however, found that Google Earth was very clunky, um, it was awkward, it was um, not intuitive, and one of them said, although it looked cool, it was more trouble than it was worth. 83% of the students, however, in the post-project survey said that they would definitely um, choose to do this project again and would prefer it over traditional research paper. In spring of 2014, so the following semester, continued with the basic concept of the project, but decided to use Omeka, which is an online content management software. Uh, Wheaton was unable to host Omeka on its servers, so I paid for a subscription, which I have to continue to maintain in order to maintain the content, which is problematic. We also ran into challenges. All the students had to, had to have admin level access, which meant that they could, of course, delete everything. <laughs> Ironically, it was another faculty member who deleted the entire exhibition. It wasn't one of the students. But it also meant, for example, in terms of grading, the students could go back in and change things after the due date. So I had to wipe out all their admin status as soon as the, the assignment was due. Um, they did really, um, they liked Omeka in many ways because they felt like they were had a really visible um, uh, example of their work, real good evidence of their work. But Omeka, as some, some of you might have seen in the previous presentation um, yesterday, one of the um, presenters, there's a lot of metadata fields involved and it is very technical and it does take a great deal of work to do it. So I thought, okay, well, you know, Let's figure out what else we can do. We also had issues. The mapping function only worked if you hosted it on your servers, which we were not doing, and you didn't have that great spinning globe kind of idea. So we then decided to try StoryMap. So StoryMap.js, as Jade has always already mentioned, comes out of uh, Night Lab. It is considered to be very intuitive. It's pretty easy to use. I am not a tech person, and within an hour, I was able to flail my way around, whereas it took me nine hours to get reasonably proficient with Omeka. Uh, it has options for students to modify the map style and also the background. So you would have this cohesive look to all the projects, but they could be individualized, which of course students really love. And I'll just show you very quickly if you can see an example of what one of these looks like. Although Domingo actually showed it here, so I can show you. And so again, you can see this movement of the the object over time and space. Yeah, oh, it's not working? Okay, we're going to exit. exit. We, will, we will just, um, just this. Um, Although far from perfect, StoryMap has worked the best of any of these projects that I have, of these mapping technologies that I've used. Um, students' biggest complaint had nothing to do with the technology. I asked them to do a research report of StoryMap and a, and a research log, and they felt that those were, um, it was, it was uh, what's the word, redundant. It was too redundant. And so what I've decided to do is I'm going to eliminate the research report, and instead I'm going to grade the research log, because that they felt was much more um, valuable. Again, I did do some, some um, survey, uh, surveys of the students. I apologize. We have had a lot of turnover in our LIS staff, and of course, I don't want to see the surveys that the students are doing because I don't want it to influence anything I might think about grading them. And when people left and their Google accounts were eliminated, the surveys were wiped out when their Google accounts disappeared. So I don't actually have the pre-semester survey for this. But as you can see, um, the majority of students, overwhelming majority of students, uh, did actually prefer these projects to a traditional research paper. And on a scale of one to five, with five being strongly agree, 
the majority of students um, agree and heading towards strongly agree that the projects improve their research and writing skills, improve their facility with um, uh, public speaking, for example. Importantly for me, this is just to make this very clear, the idea of reading objects and images. This is the bark down of grace. We had knew very little about it, except that it was called the bark down of grace. You see this rounded cliff formation here? Oh, of course it disappears. I'm really cursed. And then here, we discovered that it was from St. John's Harbor in New Brunswick. And that's an early um, 20th century photograph of St. John's Harbor. And you can actually see those rounded cliffs in there as well. It um, added documentation to the collection, and students really liked that service learning component of the project. They felt like it had a real world effect, the work that they were doing. And the biggest challenge, and I will say that this is an anomaly, it's the worst evaluation I ever got as an instructor in nine years of teaching, was um, from a very few students who felt that there was no way that I could grade them fairly, because how could I grade them fairly on a project like this if I didn't know what the answer was? And of course, that was inherent to the entire um, process. And I did try to explain that and be very clear about it, but for some students, that was challenging. Again, very, very, very few. The majority of them really love the project. This student, I used her as an example. I have permission to use their names in case you're wondering. So this is Yitong, class of 2015. She was a psychology major. This is the Japanese textile that she researched. And she basically failed to learn much of anything new about it. We still don't even know what it is. Like, we have no idea what this object was used for. But she earned one of the highest grades in, in the class, in the course, on the assignment, because she was documenting what she was doing and she was being very methodical about it. And in reflecting on the project, she said that the project now makes me feel confident. She's not a native English speaker, so this is literally what she said is, the project makes me feel confident when I tackle the problems in the research. This is my last slide. Going forward, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm going to modify the grading components and remove the report and the research log. Uh, I will continue using StoryMap.js because it works best for my purposes for this project and students seem to like it. But I will try to increase clarity about the learning to fail model that is inherent to the project. Again, it was really only that one student and a couple of friends who had issues with it. And um, also try to incorporate more required meetings with LIS staff so they have support from the technology side and also the research side. And then one of the challenges which Jade mentioned is where do these go after they're created and how do you get them ready for public view? And right now, none of these maps are publicly accessible because I haven't had the time to make the edits to them to enable them to be publicly accessible. And in the case of StoryMap.js, you have to use a Gmail account to log in. And I don't have their passwords or their logins. And so Story Map staff are actually working with me right now to try and transfer ownership of those maps to me so that I can access them. And we're contemplating, there's another form of Story Map project called a gigapixel, which is one giant image. This is kind of <laughs> one map. And I'm contemplating um, having a class do a project where they would track the different objects on campus that are displayed using, using a gigapixel Story Map instead of the one where you have the 